Hello. So I accidentally learned a bad word in a foreign language one time. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what the word was because I just met you and I don't want that to be the first thing out of my mouth. Um, but it just sounded like a random collection of syllables like you'd say when you stub your toe, like ow, only it's not ow, it's something else. Um, but anyway, I was spending time in the country where they speak this language and I was uh, teaching in an elementary school. I was walking across the room and I whacked my shin on the desk and I said ow, only I didn't say ow. <laughs> I said this other word. Did I mention this was a primary school as well? <laughs> so the children like gasped and laughed and pointed at me and the host teacher said, oh my gosh, Laura, where did you learn such a word? And I couldn't even tell her because it had just popped into my head and right out of my mouth. I don't know where I learned it. People are so good at recognizing patterns that we can pick them up and use them without even knowing that we're doing it. So I'm Laura Savino. I've worked as an iOS developer for about a decade now and have worked with a dozen different teams on about as many apps. And today, I'm going to talk about reading in a new language. Uh, and that's because a few years ago, Apple threw out a total bombshell. They shocked their entire development community by announcing that they developed a new programming language, Swift, and they wanted everyone to use it to make their iOS apps. So even seen, seasoned developers uh, had to learn this new language from scratch. And everybody suddenly had an awful lot of opinions about how to write clear code. And this experience reminded me so much of my own experience studying and teaching new human languages. So I wanted to draw on that experience to share some thoughts about how fluency relates to code. So today we're going to talk about what readable code is and then why you'd want to write it, maybe why implementation does matter a little. Uh, and then once you're convinced that you should, we'll move on to how you might begin, and finally, when you would even want to. But first, I want to convince you that programming really is a little like learning a new language. When you first do something in a new computer language, like, yes, hello, world, it prints. <laughs> like, you, you feel like a demigod, right? And similarly, after a couple of weeks of learning a new human language, maybe you work up your courage and you use your new language skills to ask a cute classmate, ah, you and me, today after class, coffee? And they say, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm busy after class. And how do you feel? You're, well, on top of the world because you asked if they could meet after class. They said they're busy after class. That means they understood you. It worked. <laughs> and to continue with the human language scenario, maybe after another few weeks of studying, you bravely ask a different classmate to coffee, and they say yes, and you go and you spend 10 minutes over lattes uh, describing how is the weather today telling each other about your families. And maybe if you're feeling very confident in your past tense, what did you do last weekend? And it is the most boring conversation in the history of conversations, but you leave the meeting feeling just wonderful because you understood each other for multiple sentences in a row. Yes. And this is kind of like in iOS, if you get some data to display in a table view or Maybe you set up a server and it responds to a request for the first time. It's not glamorous, sure, but the first time you did it in a new language, didn't you feel a little like a genius? Yeah? So going back to human languages, now let's say you've been studying for years and you're really fluent. You ask someone out on a date, you're not thinking about your grammar anymore, you're worried about whether your hair looks okay. And then on your walk together to the coffee shop, you realize that every time you mention one of your interests, they interrupt you to explain their completely uninformed but extremely confident views on the subject. And even though you understood each other perfectly well, you cannot accept the way that they structure their thinking and communication, so maybe you pretend you got an emergency text message and cancel the date before either one of you wastes any more time. 
And for code, this might be like interviewing a job candidate for a back-end engineer position. And they talk brilliantly about implementation details, and things are going really well. And then you ask them to talk through a particular task for your business at a high level, and they scoff and say, like, oh, that stuff is for front-end people. The back-end doesn't have users. And you say, you know, OK, the fact that their code runs has just become irrelevant because this is maybe an extreme mismatch for your team's values. So as, as we develop fluency in human languages and in programming languages both, we start leaving these basics of syntax behind and we focus on this nuance and on subtlety. Sometimes this subtle understanding can work against us, though. Even if we understand somebody perfectly well and we agree with their meaning, sometimes the way that they communicate their intention just kind of sits wrong with us. It makes us frustrated. And that is usually a sign that you're holding on to a stereotype. For example, people in the US will say, oh, I don't think people from the South are stupid or lazy. I would never say that about a person. No, 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 it's just the southern accent that sounds stupid and lazy. Like, <laughs> have, have you ever heard somebody express a stereotype or belief about an accent that didn't also match some of the common stereotypes and beliefs about the people? Please. But these sorts of stereotypes and biases, you may have noticed, carry over into programming languages and communities, too. Like, imagine someone seeing your code for the first time and saying to you, oh, you know, you implemented this like, you know, we'll make up a language. You implemented this like a zebra developer would. That might make you feel angry and defensive, like, oh, I have nothing in common with zebra developers. Let me tell you how I'm different. You know, or maybe it makes you feel a little proud, like, oh, you know, I, I always have had that sort of natural zebra inclination. And just imagine how that feeling is going to affect your willingness to learn from or adopt anything from these different language communities. It's based on emotion, that's not reason. We also bring a lot of expectations to code and to language. And sometimes these expectations really work against us. For example, being fluent in a second language can make it easier to learn the basics in a third. It's less surprising to learn the, about subject versus topic markers in Korean once you've already learned them in Japanese. But fluency in one language doesn't become fluency in another. In fact, it can make it harder to become fluent in the second one because something that, that just sounds right in the first one does not map to the second one the way you wish it would. For a human language example, again, usually one of the first words you learn in a new language is thank you. Americans, when we're being polite, we say thank you a lot. Like my bus driver says thank you when I tap the card for the fare. Um, my mom will say thank you if I ask her to, or if I, if I ask my mom to pass the salt at the kitchen table. Like, oh, thank you, mom, for that. But in some languages, it's ridiculous to thank someone in these situations because the phrase thank you in that language means, wow, I am really grateful to you for going to this effort. But can you imagine if, if you get on the bus, you tap your card, and the bus driver says, may I just say, that is a marvelous thing you just did. Like, okay, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> And for a code example, it's like if you use a for in loop in Swift to modify each element in an array, yes, you can write them. This will do what you think it would do. But to a fluent Swift speaker, this looks a little odd. Swift really wants you to write it more like this. They took out C-style for loops to try to encourage us to use this pattern more. If you modify a collection with a for loop, you're going to look like a non-fluent speaker of Swift. So this is my overview for parallels between human language and code. So readability. Most of us would say, without hesitation, we would love to spend our days working with clear and readable code. Uh, I think it's actually not an uncommon feeling to say, you know, given the choice, I'd rather, to have, I'd rather have code that is broken but works than code that's incomprehensible but 
or it's, sorry, this. I'd rather have code that's broken but understandable than code that is incomprehensible but somehow mysteriously works. Because if the code is, is broken but I understand it, I can fix it. And if the code is, uh, is incomprehensible and works, I'm gonna break it <laughs> one of these days. Which brings us to our first question. What does readable code even mean? I want to lead in with a story. One time, I witnessed a conversation between two devs over a code review. The first person said, hey, can we please change this pattern? I'm having trouble understanding it. To which the other replied, no, 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 see, it's more readable this way. Just let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> In English, you can describe something as readable or enjoyable without defining who is able to do the reading or the enjoying, right? It's a similar thing to, to French and to some other languages. You can say, oh, ça se lit sans trop de problème. Like, it reads itself without too many problems. Uh, it, and sometimes it's obvious when you use these construction that it's really a subjective sort of question. If you say, is LA an enjoyable city? You know that your people are going to answer, well, I don't know, it depends, for who? But for reading, if we say this code is readable, this pattern is clear, we somehow imagine that this means something without specifying a reader. There are as many opinions about what makes readable code as there are people who code. Before you can even begin to answer the question of whether code is readable, you have to first decide who is reading because we each have different strengths in these different contexts. Uh, it's easiest to see when people are, are first learning a new human language. Maybe a nurse in the US will pick up basic medical Spanish. A tourist shopping in Martinique might learn to negotiate a price in French. I went to Jaipur and realized that I had mostly practiced Hindi from Bollywood movies because I, I could tell my taxi driver, Teddy Ankhome, which means, there is a strange beauty in your eyes. But I couldn't say, stop the car, here's my hotel. <laughs> and while someone using a factory class, like, that might be obvious to use a factory for someone with a Java background, but it might seem convoluted or bloated to someone who's not familiar with that. Or a bind might be a really efficient way to express a relationship, but if your teammates haven't learned those concepts, it will obscure your intention. But it gets worse, because not only do we all disagree on what readable code is, but even if we were only ever writing for one other person ever, we as developers, we still have two completely different audiences for our code. One is the human brain with eyeballs or the screen reader and all of our biases and baggage trying to understand what the code is doing. And the other is the computer that's running through your files and executing all of their instructions. And the computer often has very strong and loud opinions about whether it understands your code or not. And since the computer is so persnickety, since it is so full of complaints, when it gets confused, we as developers, we mostly orient ourselves to the computer. I don't know if you've ever fiddled with a line of code until the program finally did what you wanted, and then like you say, okay, git commit dash m, it works. You lift your, key, your hands from the keyboard, and you kind of back away, and you vow to not touch it anymore. If you have done that, then that is prioritizing the computer audience over the human one. We try to make things better by surrounding computer-readable code with text that is only meant for humans, with comments. So, you know, if you mistype a function, function signature in your executed code, the computer's gonna throw a little tantrum, like, oh, you can't do that, what are you talking about? But an incorrect comment only gets changed if a person happens to notice the problem, if we inject a human into this system, if you will. Um, and most of the time, when someone doesn't understand a comment, they'll just kind of shrug and move on. They don't throw tantrums over that. So here, this is a helpful comment. Make sure to never change variables x and y in this line until somebody refactors, and that x becomes width and y becomes height. Now, who even knows what this means? But the next person who runs into this is probably going to say, you know, I'm not sure what this is talking about, but it looks important. I better leave it. <laughs> 
It stays around forever. It makes less and less sense as the program <laughs> evolves around it. Now, the other reason that we can't depend completely on comments is because people will just kind of take the working bits of code that you've designed, and they're just going to use them however they think makes sense. It's like when you get a new hair dryer, and you don't read the manual first. Who reads hair dryer manuals? Even like if the hair dryer has a million buttons and settings, you're going to say, yeah, I think I know what these buttons do. It doesn't matter how many times the manual says important and never and always, you're going to skip the whole thing. So it's really helpful to make sure the buttons do what you'd expect right out of the box. It would be nice if you could tape the most kind of the, with take some scotch tape and tape the most important comments to the to the handle of your functions the way that on a hair dryer it says like don't use it in the bathtub if you read nothing else just don't use the hair dryer in the water but we can't tape comments to code that way we cannot comment our way into readable code and let's try to define readable code from another angle because it turns out that even though, yes, we all have these different levels of fluency, we do all depend on the same skills to read. Working memory has a strong relationship to reading. Working memory is this extremely short-term store of very limited size. It's five to seven things. You can think of it like registers in a computer if you want. It's the thing that lets you remember someone's Wi-Fi password long enough to type it into your computer and then forget it forever. Uh, it's also the thing that when you're first learning to read, lets you remember the letters that you decoded at the beginning of a word long enough to read all the way to the end. Now, working memory, it holds on to stuff for as long as you're using it, but then as once you direct your attention elsewhere, all that information starts to decay. So, that means that if you have two things in your head, but you have to go look up the third and the fourth, you'll start to forget one and two before you have any chance of getting to five. But you read things that are longer than five or seven letters all the time, right? How many of you speak German? Especially if you're developing for Apple, and as URL error redirect to non-existent location is a constant great. So how does that work? How can we read long words? We do this with a process that scientists call uh, Cognitive scientists call it chunking. Chunking is when you take a bunch of primitive things, like letters, and group them into a single thing, like a syllable or a word, uh, and then you just have to remember the group as one thing, and that gives you some of these short-term slots back. So that is how we all understand meaning from text, whether it's language or code. We start from the pieces we understand, build them up into more abstract pieces that we also understand, and eventually really grasp the problem. Now, in code, we come across unfamiliar words or symbols all the time, uh, whose purpose, like, there's functions whose purpose we aren't familiar with, there's variables that come from God only knows where, if you are writing bash scripts, uh, and when we need to, we do stop and look them up in the docs or in the source code one by one by one. And sometimes, yeah, we end up down a bit of a rabbit hole because the definition or the implementation, now we find out, oh, that's, there's something else that I don't quite understand. And you keep researching until you find yourself on solid ground. Hopefully, by the time you finish, you remember what question you were trying to answer in the first place. But I, I want to illustrate deciphering with another human language example with a uh, part of a poem, actually. A couple lines from When Serpents Bargain for the Right to Squirm by E.E. E. Cummings. So, when serpents bargain for the right to squirm and the sun strikes to gain a living wage, when thorns regard their roses with alarm and rainbows are insured against old age, then we'll believe in that incredible unanimal mankind, and not until. I'll read it again. When serpents bargain for the right to squirm, and the sun strikes to gain a living wage, when thorns regard their roses with alarm, and rainbows are insured against old age, then we'll believe in that incredible, unanimal mankind, and not until. So, these are all words that either you know or could easily look up. But what on earth does this mean? <laughs> uh, there's, there's something really delightfully unsettling here. There's a meaning that I think 
kind of slips away, slips away until we read and reread, and then something shifts and a pattern falls out, and it is so satisfying when this resolves. And when it does, we look back on the original and wonder how we ever failed to see it. Now, it took me about 10 times reading this poem before I started to understand it, so if you're still feeling puzzled, don't worry. Um, I'm extremely confident that you could all understand this poem if you research and study and maybe read an outside analysis, whatever. And, you know, yeah, that's part of our job as developers. We put in the time and effort, especially with good tools, we can decipher the meaning. That's, that's what we do. But we're not talking today about decipherable code. The only code that you truly can't decipher should be actual ciphers, code that is literally encrypted. <laughs> Everything else we expect that we can eventually decipher. But deciphering and reading are not the same. D deciphering, needing to stop and search in a reference guide every couple of lines, this takes huge amounts of energy. It, most of us need special circumstances to be able to do it. We need quiet space uninterrupted focus, we need reasonable blood sugar levels, we can't be too hungry. And I don't know about you, but I need to have had a good night's sleep. Nah, I'm a new mom. You've maybe seen my four-month-old walking around here uh, with his dad, and if the baby's had a rough night, the next day at work, I cope by literally writing down every single question as I come across it, every hypothesis that I form about what I need to do next, because otherwise what ends up happening is that I'll navigate to a part of the source code, or I'll build and run. Swift takes a while to compile. Um, but, and then by the time I've gotten to the place where I am, where, where I'm looking for, I've completely forgotten what I, what I uh, ran the project to do. Short-term and uh, memory and working memory, they're finite for everyone. But if you don't get enough sleep, they are destroyed. <laughs> but as long as you're not completely lost, as long as you've got like a thread to pull on, rereading a poem, a diving into really dense code, it can be really fulfilling. But I argue that this kind of poetic economy of language, where you have to read and study something 10 times in order to get that satisfying feeling of understanding a deeper beauty, that has no place in production software. In production software, what we want is the sparse, immediate poetry of warning signs, where the more important, the more urgent the message, the quicker it is to understand. Reading happens when you can't stop yourself from understanding something. That's why people send images like this around as a joke, because if I ask you what colors these are, the part of your brain that reads wants to answer first. And not only is it wrong, but I bet this exercise is harder for you in the language that you are more fluent in. So what is readable code? Uh, to me, readable code is code that you understand quickly and correctly without taxing the limits of your working memory. But why? Why do, we want, why do we want readable code? We may not like code that's hard to read. We may need a good night's sleep in order to work with it effectively, but isn't interp interpreting code just another part of our job as developers? I mean, for some people, they say, yeah, you're a professional, figure it out. Which means that for some of us, admitting that we're having trouble understanding some code is basically admitting that you're having trouble doing your job. So if you see a class that you have to really puzzle over before you understand exactly what's going on, it doesn't feel like a problem with the code, it feels like a problem with you and your identity as a professional developer. And the human language parallel here does not help you at all. If you're, maybe let's say you're trying to read an article in a language you've only been studying for a year or two, you're gonna struggle through really slowly. Your friend sitting next to you who's been studying for 10 years is, is gonna skim through it quickly. They're gonna point out a grammar error. They're gonna smile at a play on words. It's really clear that the difference in speed to understanding is, yeah, related to your skill with the language. So maybe some teams decide to solve this problem by only hiring people who are fully fluent. Like, now nah, we don't hire interns, area experts only. But I don't know how many of you are trying to hire developers. How many candidates do you get who can actually read and write in your entire tech stack at an expert level? 
And let's say that you find this person, that they, they exist. They know all of the syntax, they know all of the libraries, they are really into domain-driven design, they, they've also agreed to join your team. The other engineers on your project are busy writing new code all the time, which is effectively adding new vocabulary words to the language constantly. How can somebody stay perfectly fluent in the vocabulary of a language that literally changes every hour? So, okay, maybe you accept you're not going to hire a perfectly fluent person, but you still come back and say, well, a skilled engineer, they can figure it out. We don't have to try to make it particularly easy for them. But when code is easy to read for you, you can be just kind of lazily scanning through some code and part of your brain sits up and says, hold the phone, that bit looks wrong. And then the thinking, deciding part of your brain kind of gets up off the couch and saunters over and says, oh yeah, this isn't going to work asynchronously, we better handle that. Now, there is an often cited study that I love that tests subjects' willpower with uh, fresh-baked chocolate biscuits and uh, with radishes, a root vegetable. So subjects are placed in a room with one or the other of, of, these, of these items, and after 15, and they are asked not to eat them. So warm chocolate biscuits or cold radishes please avoid eating it for 15 minutes. And then after 15 minutes, they are given a maze to try to solve this puzzle. And surprise, the maze is actually unsolvable. There is no solution. The subjects who only had to resist eating these, these cold radishes, they worked on the puzzles for an average of 15 to 20 minutes before asking for help or giving up. The people who had to resist eating the chocolate, they only worked on these puzzles for eight minutes before they gave up, and they were grumpy when they did. Now, I remember one time sitting in the back seat of a car, being driven home from a weekend at the beach by some French friends. Uh, now, I uh, studied French in college, so I am comfortable in the language. We'd been speaking French together all weekend with no communication problems, but sitting in the back seat of that car, it was a little bit warm, their conversation was just on the edge of hearing, and I relaxed just a little bit, and then it was amazing. The language became just these nonsensical sounds just washing over me. Now, you've maybe had this experience during long code reviews, where you start off going strong because you really care about these sweeping changes to the data processing layer. You want to make sure that it doesn't introduce some subtle threading bugs. So you start off reading, and then partway through, your eyes glaze over, and your posture changes. You have to really will yourself to keep focusing to actually read through at least the method signatures, at least the method signatures, to make sure that it all makes sense. And finally, you say, you know what, I'm sure it's fine to ship it. And the other problem with this is not only did you fail to reasonably review this code, but now you've used up enough of your willpower that it's going to be more difficult to focus on the next task you have to do. You might work on it for eight minutes and then say, you know what, it's impossible. So if your engineers are always deciphering like this, they're going to be exhausted and they're going to miss really basic stuff. In that poem earlier, how likely would you have been to notice a syntax error? It, what you want is, is to offload as much as possible to that snap judgment part of your teammates' brains, the part that just knows that in French, manger is not a word. Um, paying close attention, it, it takes an enormous amount of energy and of willpower, and both of those are finite. So, Let's imagine that you believe this, that decipherable code is not enough, that we're really striving for readability and that we're thinking hard about our readers. It can still be hard to know what to do, because you understand the code you wrote, right? I hope. Um, how can you predict what's going to be easy or hard for a reader, for someone maybe you haven't even met? Well, we can take a clue from our interactions with non-native speakers of our language. We're used to changing our speech when we talk to people who are communicating in their second or third or fourth language. Most of you have been doing this all conference. And we can learn a lot from those behaviors when we think about code. For example, 
You stop using so many idioms and, and slang. Instead of, you rock my socks. What? Mine is all good. Like, you, no, you are really great. And for code, instead of these in-joke sorts of names, release the hounds. Like, what does that even do? No, choose names as straightforwardly as possible. Begin, app, set up, network, requests. <laughs> Another example is that you'll enunciate clearly. Did you know that in the US, if you say, hey, G-chat, it means, did you eat yet? In code, enunciating clearly may mean that you introduce intermediate variables to label the steps of a calculation. Like, no, you don't need them, human. The, 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 the computer doesn't need them. But this kind of intermediate labeling is as close as you can get to taping a warning label to the handle of, of your, your expressions. This extra name here means that anyone who uses this result knows exactly what it's for. You also will introduce regional dialects slowly. Y'all come back now. Oh, what, did I forget something? No, <laughs> what that means is I hope you all visit again. Uh, in code, that means you might decide to wait to introduce things like custom operators. I'm not saying don't ever use them ever, I know you love them, but just think about non-native speakers of your programming environment before introducing them everywhere. But my favorite technique for readable code, though, is using patterns. Because people can learn almost any pattern, right? English speakers, we learn plural rules for child to children, woman to women, sheep to sheep. <laughs> we are completely capable of developing an intuitive grasp of patterns, even when they make absolutely no sense. Many of you speak a native language that has gendered nouns. Is it le or la? Is it di or der? Is it de or het? You use the correct one without giving it a second thought. I'm really jealous of you. But please don't make us work that hard to just know how to use your code. It's so much easier to group things together and chunk them when things that act the same look the same. So please help us to pattern match by being as obvious as you possibly can to show a very small example in code. This code here is simple. It's just setting up some variables, but even so, it's hard to scan effectively. The only difference between these variables, good idea description, description of bad idea, one is good, the other is bad, but you have to read the whole name in order to figure that out. But here, look how your eyes pick up the different shapes when the beginnings all line up like that. There's actually more code here, and yet it's easier to figure out what's going on. And this is why people get really excited about lining up the equal signs or the colons and method calls, because it highlights the differences and similarities even more. It feels like the most trivial of implementation details, but it's something that helps us recognize patterns. You can use this pattern recognition not just at the line level like this, but at the file and the function level. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the squint test. Squint is a wonderful word that means to, to close your eyes almost completely and just look out through your eyelashes so the world becomes a little bit fuzzy. You can literally squint at code to try to see its structure without any of those kind of pesky implementation details getting in the way. So I'm going to take a look. This is fuzzy on purpose. Don't worry if you can't see. That's the point. So you, you can decide right away looking at this which parts look similar, which parts might be setting up, uh, which parts are action. You might not even be able to tell what language this is, but you can pick up the different patterns. This recognition of patterns, though, it can actually work against us in a way. It can serve as camouflage if you aren't careful. I, I want to introduce you to the character that I hate the most out of all the characters in code, the bang. You know what characters look pretty much exactly the same? These are all tall and thin. They're a single vertical line, except one of these characters means, oh, by the way, the opposite of whatever you were typing. And now, in Swift, this is actually nicknamed the crash operator because it will force unwrap an optional. Now, in case you're not familiar with that concept, force unwrapping an optional means you've taken something that the compiler knows might be nil, and you, the programmer, are saying, no, 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 don't worry about it, it's fine. If it's not fine, we'll find out at runtime, we'll just crash. 
So someone here decided that portents of ill will definitely exists. It so obviously exists that it's okay to crash your user's app if it doesn't. And you, as a human reader, might not pick up on this danger sign because it happens to be sandwiched between other tall, thin characters. So usually for myself, I pull out these negativity checks into their own named variable with a name and meaning that makes it clear I'm taking the opposite of the thing. This, to me, is part of enunciating clearly. So, use patterns to help people read. Take your code that serves similar roles, make it look similar. This is going to help develop our intuition, so someday we'll be able to understand your code without drawing down our energy to do it. But how do you know which patterns will be helpful and which are gonna just be headaches? Part of it, yes, is knowing your audience. Know your readers, know their backgrounds, how people are probably going to be using this particular API you're writing, but that's not enough. If you want to write readable code, you also have to believe your audience. You have to believe people when they say your code is unclear, and this is hard. For me, I've been thinking about and writing about and, and speaking about readable code for some time and how it's different, for, like, it's different for every reader, that um, you, you really have to take each person into account, but I still messed this up on a project embarrassingly recently. I submitted a pull request to add this property to a class, and I needed it. More detail than you want, here we go. Uh, I needed it because the interactor's life cycle here needed to match the life cycle of the object that created it, but the interactor was instantiated in a local scope as a big old side effect, and the interactor just injected the, uh, sorry, the interactor just got injected into a third object. So anyway, a fix here was to, uh, to assign the interactor to a local property just before it passed out of scope. Fine. No one looking at that property is going to have any idea why it's there. And so it's got a strong risk of being deleted by someone who's just cleaning up. So I added a comment. Keep a reference to this interactor as long as the tab bar controller is alive. And I got code review feedback. Could you please explain why this is being stored here? And like, I did, <laughs> it's right there, I said it very clearly, but I had to take a step back and remember my own advice. If the person reading it doesn't understand it, you didn't say it clearly. It doesn't matter how clear it is to you, it doesn't matter how clear it is to your friend that you show it to and say, this makes sense, right? No, you, you are not your audience, your friend is not your audience. So I updated the comment, asked the team if this made sense. They say, oh yeah, perfect, that's clear now. All right. I thought it made sense before, but I am not my audience. Now, sometimes when somebody says that our code is unclear, we want to respond by asking questions like this rhetorically, right? Like, what's wrong with them? Why? We think they're just not trying hard enough. Sometimes we think they're not smart enough. Uh, Often, I don't know about you, I will catch myself thinking this at myself. What's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? Which is uncomfortable and unproductive. I don't recommend it. The more data-seeking way to phrase these kinds of questions, though, is what information are they missing that's making it hard to read this code? Now, this question works on both your teammates and yourself. Thinking about your teammates' backgrounds will help you write code that takes advantage of their particular experiences. And when you yourself are very confused reading some code, this question, what information am I missing, helps you focus on what you need instead of just how painful it is when you don't understand some code. You write readable code partly by treating your and your teammates' confusion as data. So, that is my advice for writing readable code. Be empathetic to your teammates' needs, listen to them when they say they're having trouble understanding, and be predictable. We are good at recognizing patterns, but you've got to be consistent enough for us to do it. But let's be honest, it is not always feasible to write code that is geared towards the least fluent team member. Now, this quote has been attributed to a number of different people. It's one that People always say, oh, Mark Twain. Uh, but I, I'm sorry for the long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. It turns out writing simple, clear code is really difficult. And when you're under a deadline, it can take more time than you have. 
Sometimes it just takes more skill than you have, no matter how much time you've got. It's hard. It's hard to write for two simultaneous audiences, for the, team, for the computer and for your human teammates. So this brings us to our final question, when? When do you work hard to make something readable? And when is it okay to instead require your teammates to spend some energy to understand? Uh, the, the folks who landed the Mars rover have a coding guideline that I love. Code shouldn't be arguably, but obviously correct in the most important parts of your app. Uh, if you put code that your teammates can't understand in the mission-critical parts of your app, it's like leaving piles of boxes and obstacles in a fire escape. Like, even if the fire escape is at an Olympic track and field training gym, and you know, you know that the athletes will be able to physically jump up over or around these obstacles, you don't want them to have to if they are fleeing a fire. And because if you remember, readability requires a reader, mission critical code needs to not just be obviously correct to you, the genius writer who wrote it, but to the majority of your team. It has to be clear to your audience. They are the ones who can tell you if your efforts to make readable code have worked. You've probably had conversations before and will have conversations again about whether some code is readable and whether that actually matters. So I hope I've given you some excellent reasons for sometimes strongly preferring code that you can read. So take these ideas with you next time you're having one of those discussions. Talk about cognitive overhead. Talk about working memory. Mention that reading and deciphering are not the same. Talk about willpower, the fact that it is finite. You are not as superhuman as you may have led your team to, to believe. And once you and your teammates agree on these kinds of principles, you get to use that extra energy, this cognitive resource pile that you've now retained to tackle and solve the most interesting problems that you can. You get to decipher less and you get to create more. It's the dream. Uh, as you may have suspected by now, I really, really love human languages. Uh, and Honestly, when the organizers of Domain Driven Design invited me to participate in the conference, one of my first reactions was, yes, now I have an excuse to try to learn Dutch. But <laughs> as, as I was preparing for the event, I asked one of my uh, Dutch colleagues if I could end this talk with a Dutch word that I had just learned, bedankt, for thank you. It's you know, a typical way to wrap things up in English, thank you for listening. And my colleague said, yeah, sure, that'd be fine if you asked a question or if someone helped you. So maybe not quite the right word to use. It's one of those thank you cases that's different. But anyway, I thought about it more. And yeah, I, I can say thank you in, in this way to a lot of people, to the organizers, for the thousand ways that they made this a really delightful and easy conference for me to join. Uh, to the speakers who helped illuminate all kinds of aspects of domain-driven design for me, and this entire community. You've been so welcoming to this amazing exchange of ideas in these past couple of days. So truly, thank you all so much.